Thank you, Rob. That's very kind. So could we, we need a second person to, to uh, help with taking the notes for the meeting. And we need a volunteer and we're not going to start till we have one. So that's very decisive, isn't it? So welcome everybody. I'm I'm Philip Erdley. Uh Yoshi couldn't make it this time. Um I suspect He's on remote, so hi to uh, Yoshi and to the other people on, on Meet Echo. Um, if any of you guys want to say anything at any point, uh, then we can try and get the remote system to work. Um, so we've got two, two sessions uh, at this one. The second one's on Friday. Um, there are the normal Reminders, the blue sheet has started going around. I've only sent one in because it's quite a small room. So hopefully that, could you make sure you keep that meandering around the room, the, the blue sheet, please. Um, here's the normal note well. So here's our, our agenda we've got. Um, so we've got a, a kind of a session about implementation news uh, and ex recent experiments that people have done related to the implementation uh, and some work that was done at the hackathon on um, Sunday. Uh, so that should be really interesting and we've got some news about uh, the iOS implementation which is um, also really good. Uh, we've then got a little slot on our protocol BIS work that we've been doing, a short update from Alan, uh, and then really a, a kind of room for discussion about that um, to try and work out when we think we'll be able to uh, push it through to the ISG. Uh, we've then got a longer um, session about proxies and a related uh, work to proxies. So there's a couple of new drafts there from Olivier and from Vlad. So hopefully there'll be enough time there to get some really good discussion going. Uh, and then on Friday we've got uh, a couple of other um, interesting talks. So there's one from Marcus about uh, a proposal about how to do robust session establishment and one from Quentin which is a proposal for fast subflow creation. Um, so both of those in theory can have some impact on the protocol BIS, I think. I think they're sort of proposals to imp that, that could impact on it. Uh, I didn't think there was time to squeeze all of that stuff into one session, so we'll have a little wrap up at the end, just to, um, at the end of Friday, just to revisit what we think uh, we need to do on the, on the protocol BIS. That's the agenda. Did I forget anybody requested a, a presentation slot or anything? Everybody happy? Excellent. Um, so just two slides about uh, working group status. Um, so firstly about uh, completing the completing the BIS, which is our, our primary goal of the working group to complete it on the on the standards track. Uh, we need to complete agreement on some of the items uh, that have been raised uh, and we've been working on the last few meetings. Uh, we had a talk at the at a discussion about this at the last um, the last meeting in Chicago about our different choices and we basically decided to wait for implementations to catch up with what uh, the new th one or two of the new things that have been added in in the in the BIS document uh, and because clearly in order to be on the standards track we need some implementation um, to go forward so hopefully we're getting close as we will discuss shortly to being able to then push that on um, 
the the other activity we've got um, going is about multipath TCP proxies. We had a good discussion about this at uh, at the last meeting in Chicago. Um, we talked a bit about kind of assumptions and criteria, uh, and we had agreement that minimising the setup time is a, is an important um, criteria for any any solution in this area. Uh, and then we talked a bit about the, the, the three high level solution approaches that people have um, people have, have mentioned so I think the to summarize what happened in that, that meeting most people favored um, one of those which was which is the which was called the um, the plain mode draft however when we when we did a more kind of formal look at that on the list we didn't really find a, an approach that um, quotes everyone can live with which is uh, the definition of consensus or one of the yeah it's the definition that you suggested you use um, so from that we think that more work is needed so that's why we're having uh, a lot more discussion here at this meeting um, and just to alert people I guess uh, most people here will know about the banana uh, boff that happened yesterday which was a working group forming boff which um, my interpretation is that went that went well, and that uh, there was you know, support for working group. There was a charter discussed, which was basically people like with some wordsmithing to go on. Um, so two of the things that working group uh, should do is firstly determine how local and remote uh, banana boxes, which really means a, a proxy, can find each other, um, and Secondly, to look at uh, specifying a signaling protocol to transfer useful information between the two uh, banana boxes, uh, and then this this working this new working group will will say, well, uh, you have to has to work with other IETF working groups. I guess our group being a key example of that on making sure those things meet their needs. So that's something we're going to. Um, have to make sure we have input as a working group uh, or as individuals into that banana activity as it, as it takes off. Um, so that was it as an introduction. Any Anything anybody wants to have further discussion at this stage? Right, so first on the agenda is Christoph. PDF's okay, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Hello. Um, this is just going to be a short uh, update on the implementations of MPTCP, or some of them and the status of them. Um, next slide. So I will start with the iOS implementation. That one is just not working. Uh, as most of you know, we are using MPTCP at Apple um, since now about iOS 7. And um, we have been using it for Siri. Um, the use case for Siri is mostly because users have a tendency to use Siri while they are walking out of their home. Uh, they use it um, while they are walking. They ask Siri, I don't know, navigate to a certain destination. And so it's very common to basically lose the Wi-Fi connectivity while they are doing this. <coughs> so as they are losing Wi-Fi and Siri is just creating a single connection to the server to stream the voice over to the server. And uh, this connection is really critical. If this connection gets dropped or gets closed, then um, basically Siri doesn't work. Uh, because we need would need to recreate a new connection, resend all the traffic again to the server. And so MPTSP is really a perfect use case for Siri. And we have seen over time that um, we have certain metrics for Siri where we are measuring the performance. And we have one metric that is called the time to first word. That means the time that it takes for the first spoken word to appear on the screen. Uh, so it's the time between you speak it until it appears on the screen. And in the 95th percentile, this has been reduced by 
and adjustment reduce because, well, with MPTSP we are able to choose between Wi-Fi or cell. And in the latest iOS releases, I think since um, iOS 9, we didn't only use MPTSP for handover, but we also used it for latency reduction by basically whenever we saw that Wi-Fi is being too slow um, up to a certain threshold, we basically started using cellular data. And especially in then in the worst case scenarios, like the 95th percentile, in those cases we saw the improvement uh, of 20% uh, time to first word. And then also the network failures, which is basically the scenario when people are walking outside of their um, outside of their home and when basically Wi-Fi drops. In those cases, we saw a 5% reduction of those failures, which is um, pretty huge. So it, it was already very low, but now it's really almost negligible, the number of network failures that we see with MPTCP for series specifically. Um, you know, next slide. So then we have quite a bunch of other multipath technologies in iOS um, also already since quite some time now. This one, Wi-Fi Assist is since iOS 9. And Wi-Fi Assist is very similar. I brought the slide actually just because um, we also have another presentation coming up that is also very similar to our Wi-Fi Assist, which is basically Wi-Fi Assist is the technology that chooses the interface for the initial subflow. Um, so whenever we create a connection and Wi-Fi is in a marginal state, that means the uh, signal strength is too low or some other factors that make iOS believe that Wi-Fi is not good enough, then we basically, we first create a connection on Wi-Fi and after a certain timeout, we create the connection over cell. And so we take the one that wins this race. Um, and so this is kind of the way that allows us to choose which initial interface to, to select. And um, um, there's a presentation coming up later, MPTSP Rope from T-Mobile, I think, or Dutch Telecom. And um, so it's very similar to this. Um, now, as part of Wi-Fi Assist, we have then added now in iOS 11, we also added MPTCP into it. And so um, you can go to the next slide. So in iOS 11, uh, we are opening up MPTCP as a public API. So people can start using it and MPTCP will be steered by Wi-Fi Assist. That means um, Wi-Fi Assist is basically imposing some limitations on the amount of cellular data that an application can use when Wi-Fi is in a marginal state. So that means basically, um, when Wi-Fi is available, usually people don't expect that an application uses cellular data. Um, but Wi-Fi Assist enables the usage of cellular data even when Wi-Fi is there. And so Wi-Fi Assist is simply putting a cap on the amount of data one can send on cellular when Wi-Fi is available. And MTSP is just going to be part of this limitation and part of those triggers that send traffic over the cellular data. Um, and so in iOS 11, the opening up of the API will be done in uh, three different ways. We use the handover mode, um, which tries to minimize cellular data usage at all cost. The interactive mode that uh, we are using for Siri and the aggregation mode that is available for developers only. Um, next slide. Yep. Julius Krobacek, just two quick questions. So uh, who picks the mode, the user or the developer? The developer. Okay, and what does it mean only for developers, since so, the developer picks in any case? Sorry. What does it mean in your last point that it's only for developers? Oh, um, only in basically um, the aggregation mode, you can only use it on a developer phone. That means there's a, there are developer settings when you have opted in your phone, and then you can enable the aggregation mode. Yep. Hi, this is uh, Devashish. I have one question, like uh, in Wi-Fi Assist, right? When you are trying to steer towards uh, cellular connection. So now, if there are supposed two interfaces on the cellular connection, is there any way to choose them? Which one is the best? Two interfaces on the cellular connection? Yeah. Uh, in iOS, we don't support this. Well, yeah, so at least there's a possibility there will be two interfaces on the cellular connection. So right now you're not considering anything like that. We don't have such kind of a use case. Okay. No, so we don't we don't care about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank do you. you do you have use cases where there yeah, are two we, interfaces? Yeah, uh, we, we see some use cases where it is possible on the cellular connection there may be two interfaces, say oh. two IP addresses assigned. I see. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, in iOS at the moment we don't have this, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. So um, the handover mode, the handover mode, whenever Wi-Fi is available, we only create a connection on the Wi-Fi interface, and we don't use cellular at all. Um, we will only bring up the cellular data if Wi-Fi Assist is telling us, wait, uh, Wi-Fi is not good enough, and it has a chance of dropping out, so basically based on the signal, signal strength. And only then we bring up the cellular data and we start sending the cellular if uh, we are getting retransmission over wi retransmissions over Wi-Fi. Um, we recommend the developers to use the handover mode, for example, for, for long lift persistent connections. Um, the interactive mode. Uh, the interactive mode, we use Wi-Fi and cell at the same time. We bring up both together and we schedule the traffic so that we minimize the latency. Um, we still send more traffic over the Wi-Fi interface, but if the latency is a little bit too high on Wi-Fi, we send the traffic on the cellular interface. And that's the mode that we at Apple, we are using it for Siri, and that's the one where we saw the 20% latency reduction uh, for the time to first word. Um, for this uh, particular mode, we recommend to only use it for latency sensitive and low volume flows because they can actually send quite a lot of data on the cellular interface. Um, if an application developer would use this mode and would send too much data, what will happen is basically the Wi-Fi assist will blacklist this application and will uh, prevent it from using MPTCP because we have those limitations that prevent an app to use too much cellular data. And then finally, the aggregation mode that we are exposing only for developers and the reason why we expose it only for developers is because the aggregation mode will send a lot of data on the cellular link. And we are basically looking for um, use cases. What, what use cases do you see, or the developers see, or maybe here in this room see, where, we, um, where this tiny little bit of additional capacity would be worth the cost of sending so much data on cellular link? Because at best, one can only double the capacity of the of the Wi-Fi link. That's one what the maximum one can do, and so the use cases are, seem to be very uh, narrow and very specialized, and not for the general public. So that's why we restricted it for now only for developers. Um, next slide. Yeah, and so that's all about iOS 11. The API is open and starting in September October. We will be um, sending out the updates for iOS 11 to all to all customers, and from that moment on, we hope that many application developers will start using it. And we will. I hope that maybe in a year I will be here and, and be able to show some numbers. We will see that. Um, now let's get to the next one to the Linux implementation. On June 4th, we have re released a new uh, MPTCP stable kernel. Uh, it's based on version 4.4 uh, of the upstream Linux kernel. The new features in this release were that um, there were two new socket options that allow applications to select the scheduler and the path manager. We, it has been several uh, years now that we had multiple different schedulers and path managers to use in Linux, and they were, uh, one could choose them with um, the syscontrol. Now uh, they can also be chosen through a socket option. Um, one use case for MPTCP was where people were setting it up um, on a home gateway router, for example, and basically doing um, bonding of multiple interfaces. And they saw that sometimes some subflows were uh, timing out because, for example, the net mapping got lost. And well, when that, this happened, basically, our, our uh, the Linux MPTCP implementation was basically not recovering this subflow. So in this new release, what we added is basically whenever a subflow dies because of uh, timeouts or some other reason, we basically create a new subflow again so that this interface can be used again. So that's also new in the new release. And finally, we also have uh, an MPTSP info API to get more details about the subflows, more details about the state of the MPTSP connection. So that's new on the Linux side, and the implementation is available on the usual website. Um, yeah, and that's that's all from my side. 
Markus from Deutsche Telekom. I have a question related to the iOS implementation. Um, do you plan in future to support MPTC proxies from, from the iOS itself? Oh, we, uh, um, we can, I cannot make any statement about future unreleased products. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we can discuss later. Okay. <laughs> Any more comments or questions? Thanks, that's really interesting. And I hope there are lots of uh, application developers who can now start using it easily via the API in iOS. That's great. Uh, who's up next? Fabian. Is Fabian here? Oh. <laughs> Uh, which one of these is it? It's that one, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know why that's done that. That's weird. But... I guess so. <laughs> I've no idea why it's doing that. It's sort of old, isn't it? Let's leave it up. That'll do. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Fabian Duchenne, and I'm going to give uh, some updates about the address advertisements and the load balancing modification we discussed uh, past the IETFs. Slide, please. So, first, an update on the draft that's summarize all the load balancing techniques and the adaptation we can make to MPTCP to make it work in load balancing. So we added an, a part on the application layer authentication that's been made by Alan. Uh, basically, it decouples the um, token signal in the option uh, from the key used uh, in, for the authentication. So basically, it's an application layer authentication. I think it's uh, some words missing. If it's OK, but with the figure, probably we have a problem. Uh, the next step for this draft is to add some security consideration because we haven't done it yet and it's still important. Next slide, please. So, about the address advertisements, um, we discussed that a lot uh, during IETF 96 and 97. Uh, out of five proposals we made, uh, we kept two, which were the node join flag in the MPK table and uh, the echo flag in the ad address. So, what was that? Next slide, please. Just a quick recap of what it was. The no join was basically allowing the load balancer to tell a client, please don't send an MP join on that address because it cannot be used to join. So here we have the example with uh, the green IP that cannot be used to send join. Why? Because the um, load balancer are, are hashing most of the time based on the five, out of the five tuple. So if, if a join tried to join on this address, the server may hash it to another server and then it will not it will not join. So the no join was just allowing the load balancer to, to tell the clients, please don't join on this address. Next slide, please. Um, the other one was making the ad address re reliable. It seemed important in load balancing, and I will show uh, why after. But to make the ad address reliable, basically we use the echo technique. So if you look here, we send an address with the echo bit to zero, meaning it's a real ad address, it's an address advertisement. This one is lost. So without receiving um, an echo bit to one, the server will just send the address again until it receives an acknowledgement for that. So the acknowledgement is the echo bit. Next slide, please. So with this, we try to make multipass CP friendlier to uh, load balancer and any cast. Oh, well, what was the point? The point was we were trying to change slightly multipass CP to make it work with existing load balancer. A lot of done has been work to modify load balancer to make that them work with MPTCP. Here we are taking the problem in another way, making, okay, we don't change the loan balancer because they are there and nobody is going to upgrade them to support MPTCP. And uh, we change MPTCP to make it work with those load balancer. How did we do that? First, we implemented the two proposals that I presented just, now, just before. So the no join in the uh, reliable address. And we designed a um, path manager that was specific for the balancing use case. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's the general idea of uh, this 
load balancing path manager. It's actually pretty, pretty, pretty simple. So it's you have to add a public IP address to um, each server. I know it's sometimes complicated, but this is the the design we're trying to make. Um, so you add an IP ad a public IP address that doesn't pass through the load balancer on each server. It could be an, an IP address or an IPv6, for instance, and this is more realistic. Um, just a slash 64 of, of um, slash 56. Sorry. So you add a range on the server, so the server can um, generate IPs and send them to the client. So the server needs to advertise it reliably to uh, the clients. Why? Because the idea here is to put the load balancer off path. So when the first flow is established, the first thing the server will do is advertise the new IP address, the one that's di directly connected to the internet, so the client can join this address. Then you put the first flow in backup mode, so you don't use it. You don't cut it because it can still be useful if the new subflow is cut, but you put basically the load balancer off path, so you expect all of the traffic, or except the three or four packets that you are used for the three way and shake and the and the address, to go through an, uh, a separate link. With this, the load balancer is kind of only used to match uh, the client and the server. So you use the load balancer that will make the decision you go to this or this server, then you connect directly to the server and you don't use the load balancer connection again. Uh, the implication of that is you don't need um, big hardware to make your load balancer. Uh, you don't need a lot of reliability because if the load balancer goes down during the connection, the connection continues, and that's the idea. So you could, it's a bit of a stretch, but you could make a load balancer with a Raspberry Pi for all I know, it would work. A slide, please. So the pseudo code for the, load, uh, for the load balancing path manager is pretty, pretty simple. It's basically generate a new IP. Why generating a new IP? When you have a range, for some security purpose, there is a discussion about that in the uh, in a paper that I will present after. But you could say, okay, I will not just add one IP public IP address on my server because I don't want the whole world to know how to directly connect to my server. So on the fly, here we generate a new IP in a in an IPv6 range, and we advertise that new IP only to that client. So the client will connect to that one, and when the client disconnects, this IP address is removed and it's not used used again. So you generate the IP, you advertise it to the client, and you set the backup mode on the first step flow. Next slide, please. So how does this work with layer 4 load balancer and modified load balancer? Um, on the most left part, you have the traditional NAT setup, where basically all the traffic goes through the load balancer, upstream and downstream. Everything goes through the load balancer. In that case, the load balancer is a bottleneck because all the traffic is going through him. In the middle, you have the direct server return. This is heavily used in the industry. Basically, all the, the traffic coming from the clients to the server is going through the load balancer. But the, tra the traffic coming from the server to the client is using a dedicate, dedicated link. Uh, this is good when the um, client downloads files, but when you upload files, the load balancer is still a bottleneck. So, this architecture was, we know that there are a lot of di DSR, so direct server return in the wild, so we were like, Mm, you, we could use those architectures to make it better with MPTCP. So if you look at the MPTCP figure, the red traffic is the establishment of the first subflow, so the subflow that's used to advertise the address, and then in blue you have all the traffic that, that goes both ways before the between the clients and the, um, load the server. So the load balancer is not used. Next slide, please. So to evaluate this, uh, we took that very simple setup where you have a 100 megabit per second link between the client and the um, load balancer. Uh, the load balancer is a traditional Linux LVS. We didn't change anything. It's just like it's used in the wild. Then all the server have a direct uh, 1 gigabit per second link uh, connected to the server. We run a lot of clients, HTTP clients, that do are downloading or uploading files between um, the client and the server. So what you would expect showing that is that the clients download that roughly uh, one gigabit per second in MPTCP and, and roughly uh, 100 megabits per second in TCP. Next slide, please. <coughs> so the results, uh, there were a lot of figures. So I'm, I will not be able to prove anything here because I need a lot of figures to prove uh, what I'm saying. So you have two solutions. Uh, you believe me or you read the paper after, but if I have to present all the figures, uh, this discussion will be longer than the one on the proxy and nobody wants that. So, 
<laughs> so what we see here is basically MPTCP is not affected by the loss. Here, yeah, cl clearly, it's not ramping up fast, but it's because of the latency. We have a 200 milliseconds latency. If I showed you the um, figure without the latency, you could see that actually MPTCP is not affected uh, by the loss. It could be that if the ad address, and that's why this proposal was important, if the ad address is not reliable when you have loss, this will impact MPTCP a lot for big for, for bigger file size because here we were downloading four gig, four gigabytes in total, splitted in one KB, ten KB, one hundred KB. So if when you have very huge file size, if the address is lost, the fast flow will not be established, and then it costs a lot in terms of performance because you will download a big file via the one hundred megabit interface. So. If the address is not reliable, I can't show the plot here because I don't have time, but basically it affects MPTCP a lot because here, instead of ramping up, it's just crashing because each, each address lost means a big file that has to go through the 100 megabits per second link. So the bigger the file, the bigger the cost of losing the address. So with that kind of um, a situation, you really want the address to be um, reliable. Next slide, please. So something else now, we also apply that to any cast because yeah, it works with overlancer, but it also works with any cast. So in this simple um, schematic, if the clients, so the, those two servers are announcing an any cast address, the same any cast address. So before the red cross, if R1 wants to connect to the any cast address, it will be routed directly to R2 and then to the server. If during the TCP connection, the links between R1 and R2 fail, then the client will be sent to uh, um, the node that is connected to R4. Then what happened to the TCP connection? It's reset. And we don't want that because if I, if I was downloading a huge file and then cut in the middle of that and there is a reset, I will have to start again probably. So I don't want that. So next slide, please. We made uh, a setup to simulate that. Uh, on the router here, you have the anycast address that is routed through the server. Each, each server does have the anycast address and a public IP on the same interface. So it's just a routing configuration. We are not removing a link, but each server is a, it does have the anycast address on the loopback and uh, public prefix. So what do we do? We will send packets. The router will do some ECMP and basically just load balance the traffic among the three servers. So what happened next, please? So what happened? We simulated uh, a reconfiguration in the network, like I showed uh, two slides earlier, when the links go down. So we have three servers, and ev every 10 seconds, we remove a server from the CMP pool. So all the traffic will have to go to the two servers. What do we see on this graph is in blue, it's the total bandwidth. So when everything goes fine, we have um, roughly three gigabits because each server is connected to uh, via one gigabit link. So you have three gigabits, but when one server goes down, you are down to two gigabits, which is the sum of the two other links. So that's expected. So you see every, t every 10 seconds, we have a drop of roughly five seconds, because that's what we do. And then uh, we re-add it, and that's why it's ramping up again. In red, you, uh, you see the resets that we are received, and that's, that's the problem that I described earlier, is when you are reconfigured to another server, you will get a reset here. We've you see that we have huge spike in resets when the server is removed from the ACMP pool, which is logical because that server cannot be reached, so we are hashed to another server. But we also, we also see a spike in the reset when the server is set back again because ACMP just um, recomputes all the hash and then a fraction of the flow will be sent to the server. So you will get reset in that case too. Next slide, please. With MPTCP, that's what we expected. We have no drop in the bandwidth and no reset is sent. Why? But because even if the anycast address subflow fails, um, the direct connection to uh, the public IP address is not disconnected. It means that no client will be interrupted during a download. Sure enough, if uh, the server stays down and the connection from the client is terminated by the client and then re-established, then it will be hashed to another server. But with MPTCP, you basically allow your clients to finish what they are doing when you are reconfiguring the network. So when you reconfigure the NECAS network, you don't disconnect people. Um, they will just have the time to finish um, their download, and then they will be asked to another server. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, so 
in conclusion, we made some uh, simple change to MPCP, and I have to insist it's very simple, and that was the idea. Um, to make it work with unmodified load balancer, we are improving the performance, the reliability, and we are solving the bottleneck problem we have with net configurations. And we also allow MPCP to be deployed and used in any cast service, which is a new use case. I don't remember even seeing anything said about that. So all the results will be presented in a paper that will be presented in October in ICNP in Toronto. And that's it for me. Yeah, Alan. I just wanted to clarify, this is using vanilla 6824-bis as it stands now. This wasn't any further modification. Yeah, no, no, there's no modifications then, yeah. Thanks. Alan Ford. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks, Naomi. And let's just see where we're at. Um, excellent. Olivier. Oh, it's not Olivia. Oh. Uh, how is the blue sheet doing? Where's it got to? The blue sheet? Where is the blue sheet? <laughs> Has everybody on this side <laughs> signed the blue sheet? One or two have. And nobody on this side signed it. Can you keep it moving? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Quentin. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Quentin, and I will be I will do a short presentation about the hackathon, what we have done, and uh, to trigger some discussion about the RFC uh, 6824 piece. So, next slide, please. Oh. Ah. Okay. So we did uh, a few stuff related to multipath CP, some usage, and so on. Uh, related to the socket API usage, uh, about uh, uh, documenting multipath CP and other stuff that uh, are related to new feature added in uh, the this version of the RFC. So next slide. So this presentation will mainly focus on these three uh, propositions uh, in uh, the BIS. And so next slide. So first, uh, the multipath uh, experimental option. So uh, basically that. This allows us to exchange uh, opaque data uh, between them via uh, an option that uh, can contain basically anything. Uh, it was part uh, during the hackathon we partially implemented it, so uh, we we done the the transmission and the parsing of at uh, the option reception. And the main thing that we need some clarification about uh, this option is what about the S bit, so the synchronizing bit. So basically what it does, it says that when you say you set the synchronizing bit, you require that, or at least you expect some uh, response from the remote host. And the question is about, is that to be reliable? What about if uh, the, the, the packet that contains an option with a as bit is lost? Do we have to uh, ensure that it is uh, send or not, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, an, it's an open question, actually. Uh, so next slide. So we may come back to that when people have had yeah. a chance to for, ponder for, Probably, it probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so about the multipath uh, TCP reset option, so basically this allows us to explain why our subflow was reset on an MPTCP connection. So it is implemented in, uh, in Linux, so it's okay. And uh, we raise additional uh, discussion about this. So the first one is about, we have the T-bit uh, that that uh, say that is the error uh, transient or not, to know if uh, it is worth trying to reestablish a subflow. Uh, does that is to be taken into account if the code is different from uh, the multipass unspecified reason for a reset? So, for instance, if you have, uh, let's say, a multipass specific error, does it have to be taken into account by the receiver? Uh, also, another thing is that the option today is only sent 
when we try uh, we, when we decide to send the reset but we don't keep state about why we reset the subflows because of uh, of uh, memory reasons and resource uh, reasons so next slide please and about uh, the reason code that were defined the RFC we found some cases where we can define additional code so the first one is what about if you try to do a MP join with a token, but the token does not exist anymore on the, the server you try to establish a new subflow? Does it work to have a new reason code or not? Don't know. Uh, then, what about if a subflow timeout for the remote host, and uh, but the connection is still alive? So, for instance, you sent a lot of data on. Uh, on one subflow, and then you tr decide to uh, use a second subflow that was established much before, but it was uh, removed because uh, the server did not use the subflow. Does it has to, to have a, a, a special reason code for that? Also, if we decide to remove a subflow because we had a remove address, do we have to set a special code reason for resetting this subflow too. Uh, yeah. All right, let's quickly tackle these, but any deep, any bigger discussion should probably be taken to the list. But the general point is that MPTCP reset option was to be analogous to an actual, to, to, to go on a, a, a TCP reset on that connection to carry some additional semantics. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, unknown MPTCP connection, there really is no point in in sending that out. You don't want to differentiate that. You don't want to even go anywhere near the MPTCP, rest of the implementation for that. Um, timeout, again, the reason codes are all things that, oh, I'm trying to remember now, when we talked about the reason codes, the general logic was if if it could either be useful for an administrator to analyze a problem or for an, for an automatic resolution to the problem. For example, if it was a transient problem and it knew it was low on bandwidth due to that error, then later on it could try again, for example. But you, we don't necessarily need reason codes for, for everything. Um, certainly, we only have a limited number of bits to play with here as well. Um, and the previous slide you had, should T be set for anything other than zero, zero? Well, well yeah, because it's got stuff like um, uh, out, lack of resources or, out, or um, unacceptable performance. Those are exactly the kind of ones that would be transient that you'd want to look at later. Okay. Um, but I think that whole list of questions is ideally suited for an email rather than a discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can, uh, we can continue the discussion on mail. There is a problem. Uh, yeah, and uh, also we did not use uh, yet the code about uh, administratively prohibited creation of subflow and when you have too much outstanding data uh, on a given subflow. But uh, maybe we we will find uh, where to put this, but that's no. And next slide. And uh, there is also the new multipass capable option that was uh, made by Christoph. So basically, it allows to use connection keys that were defined at a higher level. So you don't need to to uh, to send the keys in clear over the connection. And I think uh, it works according to Christoph. So yeah. And that's it for me. Is there any reaction to this slide? Now people have had another minute to think about it. Or does this need to go to the list? And I thought again, yes, it needs to go to the list, but I think it should be a fairly straightforward fix to talk about retransmitting um, here. I just don't think we actually covered that too much. But it should be an easy fix. Julius Krobaczek, for the peanut gallery, the people who have come here out of sheer interest, what's the application of this thing? What's the application of this? Does somebody want to take that question? Um, 
experiments. <laughs> Local experiments is the answer. So if you want, for instance, to exchange uh, additional data about, let's say, the flow, or to do, to do yeah, local experiments for uh, to deploy uh, new stuff, it's basically the option this it intended for. So. Thanks, Quentin. So I skipped over, um, which I shouldn't have done, just an open call if there are any other updates about implementation news that anybody wants to share. Uh, I know in the past we've had uh, several other operating systems that have talked about or have got some of the way through or have got a lot of the way through implementing multipath TCP. So we just traditionally have a moment or anybody who has any other implementation updates and they want to share anything with us um, for them to do so if they want to. Okay, so we will move on to uh, the protocol BIS spot with, um, with Alan. This is super fast. There is one slide, apart from the title slide, which obviously we're trying to get to. Thank you, Phil. Um, this is really weird, this screen down here. This is, this is all odd. I'm, I feel I'm looking at my feet. Um, right, three changes in, in um, 08 uh, as based on feedback, implementation feedback, which is, of course, the driving motivator here. Um, Christoph's implementation has pointed out quite significantly that there were some issues around um, clarifying that when you send data on the fourth act, so with the MP capable option being used to provide a data sequence mapping, you could end up with a situation where one end sends a data sequence signal, the other end sends an MP capable, um, and they cross, and one end was expecting one, and one end was expecting the other. So it's just to clarify that these mappings are identical and should be treated as identical when they turn up in two uh, packets. Um, similarly, also the retransmit logic for an MP capable with a data mapping in it. By just saying they're equivalent means that the problem kind of goes away. Um, I said thanks, Olivier, on port. Point two, but I actually realized it was actually Quentin more than Olivier. My apologies, Quentin, but thank you for clarifying that the uh, TCP reset in the fast close situation also put in. And finally, um, the update to SHA 256 has gone in, although I looked again and realized my search and replace wasn't quite as, uh, as comprehensive as it should have been, and there's a couple of SHA ones left. But I'll get rid of those. Um, that's it on the update. Um, and I don't think. We have anything outstanding at the moment. There's no one's proposals that have any protocol modifications lined up. There's nothing I'm aware of that has anything lined up we need to worry about either. Um, so, yeah. So I guess there, there, there's a question if, if uh, which we probably should revisit on Friday. If anybody has uh, anything that they are about to suggest to that, that implies an addition to the protocol BIS. Um, because if they have, I guess we should think about that before we uh, declare victory and, and close close it. Um, and the other question is about uh, implementation. So have we got an implementation of all the new bits that have been added to the BIS now, or not quite? My understanding, although Christoph might might shout and clarify. My understanding is this recent hacky work on iOS and Linux is now pretty much got all the best changes up to date now. Not quite. Okay. Can you can you come to the mic? Can oh, you battle away through? Or one of you can clarify. At least uh, Linux, like we're doing the hackathon. 
we implemented with Olivier and the rest of the team we implemented all the biz pieces, yep. but iOS now. Okay, sorry, right, yeah. So it's not that it, we haven't got an interoperable implementation of all, but we have one implementation of everything. So the so the your Linux implementation that's now publicly available has all the BIS items in, or the bit is going mm, to be released no. soon, basically. Yeah, the code you still needs to be released. Version. Like none of the code that was worked on during the hackathon has been released. Has yet. been released. No, yeah, but I guess so. It's all happened. But yeah. Okay, so but pending a kind of just pushing it out, then it is now everything in the BIS has been implemented. So I guess that, Mia, is that enough one implementation to push it in standards track and send it? I don't know what the current view is on these things. Uh, I I think that's mostly the judgment of the working group because there's no right. common okay. rule because all the implementation, all the pro protocols are so different. Okay, right. It should be justified in the Shepard write-up. Right, okay. So we will we'll have to discuss that. I mean, we've, 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 you know, we've got two implementations of uh, almost most of the protocol. And then there's these new bits in the BIS would have one implementation. So we'll have to talk about whether that's adequate. Uh, and yeah, maybe we should talk a bit more about timings on Friday. Is the 256 SHA 256 implementation, is that in the BIS or not as yet? Not yet. For people out there, that was Christoph saying that's it's not yet in it. Okay, so we we should try and work out a plan of how we're going to push this forward in the next uh, month or so. Um, I think we need to get a security area review to make sure that they're happy. We will think about if there's any other area reviews that should be done ahead of pushing it out uh you know because they'll they'll kind of get done in the formal process when it goes into the isg and things but we probably should start that early okay any other comments or thoughts on on the protocol bis perfect okay So we're now moving on to our proxy uh, mini session uh, with excuse me with two new drafts, one from Olivier and one from Vlad. Um, so we got a good deal of time for discussion about both of them. What we got uh, about 60, 65 minutes or so, just over an hour. So we should be able to get to a good discussion about them both. Now. How are the blue sheets doing? I haven't seen it come done. Oh, it has. Who has not signed the blue sheet yet? It's the odd person. Right, Olivia. Do you want to use your own? Okay, so let's go back to the, the proxy work. And um, let's first come back to the motivation. So uh, if you remember, if you were in MPTCP since the beginning, you know that we've had a lot of troubles with middle boxes. And we had to fight a lot with the middle box. And we managed to have something which, is, which works over the global internet. And now the next question is, 
can we design a middle box that would benefit to MPTCP? So can we get something more thanks to the utilization of a middle box? And this is part of the charter. And at the bottom, you see the, the current charter of MPTCP working group. And during the last year, there have been several proposals that, that have been discussed. So there is a draft plan mode, which has been mentioned earlier. There is a draft transparent mode. There is SOX 5. There will be SOX 6 that will be presented by Vlad later on. So there is a, a family of solutions that try to address the problem. And in this talk and in the draft, I will try to, we have tried to restart from scratch based on all the discussions that have been made on the mailing list to have a design which is cleaner and we hope easier to understand, easier to implement, and which provides all the use cases that we would like to have uh, with MPTC proxies. And to distinguish that with what you might think about proxies, we have decided to use another name, uh, which might change later on, but the, the, the name that we use is a converter. And our motivation is that there are now far more MPTCP enabled clients than MPTCP servers. And for all those clients, it's very beneficial to be able to use MPTCP on a part of the network when reaching a server which, is, which does not support MPTCP. So there is a clear use case, and there are other use cases for those kind of converters that have been discussed earlier, but I will focus on this use case now because that's the simpler to understand, and if you want to understand the basics of the protocol and the basics of the solution, it's better to start with the simple, the simple uh, use case. So let me first try to summarize what have been the, the discussions in uh, February, March, and April on the mailing list. So first point is that if we use a converter, one key point is that we do not want the converter to significantly increase the connection establishment delay. So we don't want to lose 100 milliseconds because we are going through a converter. So that's the motivation for having a solution that requires zero RTT in contrast with SOX5, for example. Second, we do not require the utilization of the converter for all the traffic. So it should be possible for the client to use the converter for some specific connections, not all the connections. And in particular, it should be possible for the client to decide to bypass a specific converter if it knows that the final destination supports MPTCP. Because if you have MPTCP end-to-end, -end, then there is no need to go through a specific converter to give you MPTCP for one half of the network while you could have MPTCP for the end-to-end -end path. Uh, there, there have been lots of discussions on whether we would use TCP options or data in the, in the payload. And one of the, the questions that was raised by Joe Touch and Julius was that if you place data in the scene, you have to use TFO, and TFO is a standard solution. And we need to be able to use TFO not only for the connection between the client and the converter, but also for the con for the end-to-end -end connection between the client and the server as we see that there is more and more support for TFO. And finally, the design should be extensible and future-proof, and we should avoid defining new TCP options because you know that putting new TCP options in a scene is a mess when you already have the MP capable, the timestamp, and all the other options that are already present there. <laughs> so what is the cleaner design that, that we came up with? So we have an application-level protocol that uses a specific port. This makes it easy to deploy the solution uh, similar to SOX. All the commands that are sent by the clients and the response that are sent by the converter are encoded as TLV messages, and using TLV messages provides extensibility. We leverage TFO so that we can put the commands directly inside the scene, which is sent by the client, like SOX v6 that, that Vlad will present later on. So the commands and the response are sent inside the scene. And we have a solution to allow the clients to learn what are the TCP options that are supported by the final servers. And this is required if we want to be able to bypass a converter, because we will bypass a converter if we know that the final server supports MPTCP in the case of MPTCP. So let's start with an example. So there are three hosts in this example. You have the client at the bottom, the server, and the converter, which could be anywhere. If you want to create a connection towards the server via the converter, what do you do? You first send the scene from the client to the converter by using the converter IP address and the port number of the converter. Inside the scene that you send, you place a TFO option with the cookie of the converter. Let's call this cookie T. 
and inside the payload of the scene, and all the information that I will show in blue will be TCP options, and the information that I show in red in the packets will be payload information which is encoded as a TLV messages. So in the payload, I have a TLV message that says, please connect me to the server S on port P. Nothing really strange. So when the client receives, so we receive this scene message, what does it do? It will create immediately a scene towards the server. The server will receive a normal scene and it can reply with the scene with a CNAC that goes back to the converter. And the converter will re return the CNAC to the client to confirm the establishment. At that point, we have two TCP connections. There is one connection from the client to the converter and one connection from the converter to the final server. And these two connections are glued together in the converter by the application running on the converter. So all the data that comes from the client will go to this connection and all the data that comes from the server will go to the connection to the client. Nothing really difficult, okay? So let's look at that in more details with two examples with different TCP connections. So our motivation is MPTCP. So let's look at what happens when you use, when you try to open an MPTCP connection through the converter. So to open an MPTCP connection, I have to put the MP capable option in the scene. So I put the MP capable option in the scene and in the payload, I indicate that I want to connect to the specified server on the specified port. The converter will send a scene which contains the MP capable option to the final server. And let's assume that the server supports MPTCP and uses RFC 6824 bis, which means that it provides its key in the MP capable option while there was no key in the, in the MP capable option of the scene. So you have the key of the server which is returned as a TCP option. The information arrives on the converter. And what the converter does is that it accepts the establishment of the connection. And once you have accepted the establishment of the connection, you need to inform the client that the connection can be established. And you need to let the client know that the server supports MPTCP. And to do that, what we do simply is that we copy the content of the extended header. So all the TCP options that were in the Synthesac, we put them inside the TLV message, which is part of the payload on the Synthesac, which is returned to the client. And then the client, when it receives the Synthesac, which contains this TLV information, it will know by parsing the TCP extended header that this connection to the server will be using MPTCP from the client to the server so that the next connection that the client will want to open to the server, it will know that this server supports MPTCP. And so there is no need to go through the converter to reach this server. TFO, we want to use TFO here, that's easy, but we also want to be able to use TFO from here to there. Let's look at what happens if we want to use TFO through the converter. So again, we assume that we already have a, cook, a cookie from the converter because we have had many connections through the converter. And if I want to do TFO with a server, you remember that in TFO, we do that in two steps. First, I send a, a TFO option, which is empty to the server. The server replies with a cookie, and then I can use a cookie to send data in the next TCP connection. So how do we do that with, when we have a converter? I will send a scene which contains the, TC, the TFO of cookie of the converter inside the TCP option. And in the TLV message of the scene, I have the connect command. And I have additional information which contains TFO, an empty, TCP, an empty TFO option. So the, co the converter will recognize that and it will send a scene with an empty TFO option to the final destination. So the final destination receives a scene with an empty TFO option. What does it do when it receives a scene with an empty TFO option? It returns the cookie that corresponds to this TCP connection. So the cookie, let's say, let's call this SC. The cookie SC is returned back to the converter. And the converter does the same as with the MP capable option. It simply copies the TFO option and puts it back inside the payload of the scene of the scene to Zach, which is returned to the client. And the client can extract the server cookie and use it for the next connection that it will create for the same server. So let's look at the next connection. 
So this is the second connection. On the state of the client, we have the server cookie, which is known. So when we send the scene to the converter, this is a scene that contains data because we are using TFO. And before the data, we have the connect command and we have the TCP option, which contains TFO and the server cookie that we have received in the previous connection. The converter will copy this information in the scene that it sends to the server and will copy the data. The server sees the server cookie that it has sent for this specific client. It recognizes it and it accepts the data. And then it's, it replies with the scene plus act, and the scene plus act is returned to the client and the connection is established. So we can support both MPTCP, TFO, and other stuff with that. Um, Yoshifumi has a question on, on the Java room. Um, he asks, um, in the uh, MPTCP case, when you convert to MPTCP, um, who decides um, to actually do this? Is it the client or the converter? Who decides to do what? So the question is, uh, when the converter changes TCP into MPTCP, um, who's deciding this, the client or the converter? When the That's client, the question. When the client changes MPTCP? No, the converter. When the converter changes MPTCP to? No, TCP to MPTCP. But this is MPTCP. So you have MPTCP and you try to establish MPTCP. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Me neither. Maybe he says something. I don't know. I'll let you know. So of course, if, you, if the server does not support MPTCP, then you don't have MP capable back. And you learn that you have MPTCP here and TCP, regular TCP there. Hi, Alan Ford. How do we, you may well, this may be coming up on another slide. How do we add another subflow to this? Well, if, if the client wants to talk directly to the server at this point, since both ends so, be... So when you have that, you have two TCP connections, so the, or two MPTCP connections in this example. You have one from the client to the converter, and one from the converter to the final server. Yep. So if the client adds a subflow, the subflow will be added between the client and the, and the converter. If the server adds a subflow, it will be added there. So nothing would go direct from the client to the so server. So it's not a bypass where you can go direct from the client to the server. So this would add a lots of com lots of com complexity complexity to do that for a single MPTCP connection, and I think it's easier to just test the first connection. And if you determine that the destination is MP capable, then you can open the next uh, TCP MPTCP connection towards the server. Oh, I see. In okay. many use cases, you have a large number of connections anyway to the server. And if not, you can apply a kind of appeable solution, or you can also try to open in parallel two connections, one via the converter and one directly to the server, and you just take the one that does MPTCP and works correctly. Okay, so the, the, the presence of all this red stuff tells you that the, well, the yeah, excellent... The red stuff here yeah. tells you that the server supports MPTCP. Right, and of course that wasn't in your previous example. And in the previous experience. example, it wasn't there. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, Vladimir Oltano. So my question has something to do with TFO. Uh, isn't it a bit dangerous to tell the client your TFO cookie? So the, pro the client gets to know the proxy's TFO cookie and then it can uh, do all kinds of nasty stuff with it. Yeah, so the question is, why do you give the TFO cookie to the client and not keep it on the converter itself? Yes. It really depends on what's your type of deployment that you have mm. on the converter. So if you think of a converter that has a single IP address and this single IP address is shared by all the clients, then you don't want to reveal the cookie which is mapped to this IP address to all the clients because they could be able to do uh, traffic directly. But if you have a deployment where the converter has not a single IP address but a pool of IP addresses, and you map client address on one of address of the pool, for example, then it makes sense to send the cookie back to the client. I see. Okay. Thanks. Um, I see that there's the uh, TFO cookie T inside the SYN sent to the converter. So it kind of, uh, I think uh, in the draft it said like it recommends to preemptive, uh, proactively uh, refresh the cookie. 
So my question is, how much do we rely on TFO for this sin? Like, if for what another reason, even if it's not because of the cookie, we fall back, does it still work? I think so, but. So what? So the question is, what happens if, for example, the converter changes its cookie, and so we have a wrong cookie on the client side? But that's the normal procedure of TFO that we that would apply there. So you would not hack uh, the the content of the data. So you would not hack the message there, and there would be a fallback, and you would restart, and you would have two FTT instead of one FTT in this case. Yeah, and that's the normal T, T, TFO procedure. So what, one of the of the objective of the design was to have extensibility, and if you think about extensibility, there are two dimensions that need to be considered. The first dimension is the extensibility of the application level protocol that includes the TLV messages, and we get that by using TLVs and version numbers, so we have a solution which is easily extensible. And you have to look at extensibility from the TCP viewpoint, what happens if TCP is extended, and if someone has another crazy ID than MPTCP. And we would like to use that through the converter. Well, this is feasible as well because we can detect what is the TCP options that are supported by the server. So we have flexibility and extensibility in the design of the protocol. So the client can decide to bypass the converter once it has detected that the converter, that the server supports the options that he would like to use. So if at one point all clients are using MPTCP and all servers are using MPTCP, then all clients will detect that they, there is no need anymore of the bypass and nobody will use the bypass anymore. So now <laughs> let's go back to the criteria that Phil and Yoshi sent on the mailing list about how to compare different solutions uh, for, for proxies. So the criteria, and I tried to summarize the email because I could not fit the content of the email in a slide. So the, the, the sentences were pretty long. So the first comment was no changes to MPTCP. So there is no change required to the, the current spec. Uh, proxy is simple to operate and deploy. Well, this is like SOC, so we need an IP address and a port number. So you can place the converter anywhere in the network. So this is existing best current practices. A uh, session can be initiated from either end. We believe this is feasible, but this is not part of the first draft because we want the draft to be simple. Setup type is minimized, so we, we provide that thanks to the utilization of TFO. Design minimizes the amount of overhead on data. Basically, the only overhead that we have is the TLV messages that we place inside the scene and the scene plus act. So the overhead, the overhead is only for the scene. We don't need any encapsulation scheme. And the solution works if end-to-end -end encryption is in use. Uh, the solution is compatible with end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, the only issue is that if you, since we are use, if you use different IP address on the client and on the on the converter, you would have in a, you would be in the same situation as with a NAT. And so, if you have an encryption that relies on the validation of the IP addresses, then you will have issues. Other criteria that were mentioned for single-ended proxy scenarios: the proxy is unlikely to be on both default paths. So this is the case. The converter can be anywhere in the network. Clarify whether the proxy simply forwards. Well, the converter terminates TCP connection and maintains states for the two TCP connections from the client to the converter and from the converter to the uh, to the server. Allows us to have traffic that doesn't get proxies. So this can be based on policies or automatic bypass when, once you have detected that the server supports the TCP option that you want to use. And, and host and proxy need to authenticate. We believe that it's possible to put authentication scheme in the protocol by using the TLV messages. But if we, uh, we say the word authentication, then we'll have 20 people in the ITF saying that you would like to support our authentication scheme. And it will not be a draft, but five drafts. And so I want to keep the solution simple. But we can add authentic authentication schemes inside the draft as well. So to conclude, this is a new design which takes into account all the comments that have been raised on the list. That's an application level protocol, so we will have to reserve a service, pay, a service name and port from the INA. It provides zero FTT using TFO, which was the key issue. Uh, and the client can bypass the converter if the server supports the option. And our request to the working group would be adoption of this document for charter item. And with that, I've covered all the basics, the details are in the draft.
Julius Krobacek. So I'll make some more substantial comments perhaps after the SOC 6 talk. Here I have just two minor comments. One is about extensibility. I haven't found in the draft where you say what to do when you see an unknown TLV. The intent is pretty clear, but you don't actually say it. Uh, when you see an, an unknown TLV? Yes. Or the, there is an error TLV in the draft? Yes, and so you, you give the error, it. but you never say what to do. Never say what to do. You never tell the implementer wh whether that he should uh, return the error and drop the connection, which I oh, assume yeah, is the intent. Is what, what okay, this needs yeah, to be yeah. said. And the other thing, so again, that's something, the intent is perfectly clear. So you say that it's a normal user space proxy. Now you are doing some rather exciting stuff with TCP in here. Okay, for very good reasons. I understand very well why you're doing that, but you're returning the unchanged SYN header, uh, yeah. SYN ACK header and you are actually replying by a SYNAC only after you've received the SYNAC from the other side. Yeah, and the reason why we are replying with the SYNAC on, only when we have received the SYNAC is that we want to be able to test whether the connection to the server works correctly because we know that there are many API ball solutions where you try to open multiple TCP connections in parallel to a given server. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you are not in a situation where some of the connections always succeed even if the, the, the server is not there because this would incre this would produce uh, new types of failure scenarios that would be difficult to detect by the applications. Mm -hmm. So that's for yeah. very, very good reasons. So it's but clear that there are some small changes to be done to the interactions between the application and the TCP stack. Yeah. This and is I not something that, that, uh, that a student who is doing networking 101 will be able to implement in one afternoon. No, even 301. So there's more on Jabba. I, I, I have to admit I don't get the question, so I'll just read it out loud. Uh, in the scenario of a middle box between an end device, what? There's more, okay, uh, with only plain TCP support and a middle box talking to a server in the in the platform in MPTCP, is the client the middle box? So there's more. The middle box would implement a TCP proxy for the end device and send the traffic in MPTCP to the converter or possibly directly to the destination server if it is detected to support MPTCP. Uh, I suggest to put that to the list. Yeah. Mia Kulevind, um, this is working here. Uh, as you say correctly, this is kind of an application layer protocol. And it's also not, it can also not or it can be used for other things than just MPTCP. So I assume this is not the right group. Sorry to say that. <laughs> so so the, the, the discussion on, on the mailing list was that it was important to have a solution which is extensible. Yeah. So we came up with a solution which is extensible. No, I mean, this was not a comment about this is the right or wrong solution or whatever. I just think this is the wrong group to work on this solution. You're speaking as an individual or as an... <laughs> right now as an individual, but I can change it any time. <laughs> oh, <but laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, just one clarification to this one. I think that's, yeah, it, it depends what ambition do we have as a, as a working group. If we want this, this solution to be specific to the MPTCP, the document will be, we'll talk only about the how we handle the MPTCP connections, and we don't talk about the other other usage outside MPTCP. So it's just a matter of, I would say, scoping of, of the document. So if that's what we want, we just, we can we can say clearly in the specification that it's only for handling the MP capable and the handling of other TCP options is out of scope of this document and, and we are done. For me, it's just, just a matter of scoping of, of the specification, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, like, you cannot say, you can use it for other things, but we don't look at it, so it's, it's <laughs> And what, what further, if, if it's an application layer protocol, which is, I think, the correct term, it's not MPTCP. We have to remind ourselves why we ended uh, with the applications, um, application um, uh, layer proxy. This is one of the main comments that we receive in the mailing that people say that if you wanted a proxy, just reserve a port number. And we are hearing what the working group wants, 
and that's why we are asking to to raise the board. If now you see that's no, this is the direction. So we go back because we have. Oh, okay. that's no, no. So this is this is the right direction, but it's not the right working group. <laughs> So I'm like, um, yeah, and like, actually, um, additional question. Say so this also. Say uh, then I thought about which one is the right working group, right? Don't have a good answer yet, um, but um, to some extent, it sounds a little bit like ice as well. So maybe this is something to look at if you can, maybe can use existing protocols for this use case. But but then my question will be, what do you think will fit? In the last charter item, which is the working group, will explore whether an MPTCP OA middle box would be useful. Well, so at least one I know is MPTCP enabled. So if you look at the charter yeah. on the first slide, yes, I think we are ans answering the charter. So this charter doesn't. So the charter so defines what yes. the working group is expected to do. Yes, but it doesn't mean that this has to result in an MPTCP document or in any kind of outcome. It will explore the options. And uh, and probably what's really in scope would be maybe an infor informal document that is describing how to use options that may or may not be developed in other groups. So we, I think we should talk about it <laughs> off, off uh, in a sort of smaller gathering because it's quite tedious for most people which work at ITF working group things are done in. But I mean. We're, I'm, I'm happy for us to you know it's relevant to multipath TCP to give it some time is great. If it has to be talked about in other groups, that's fantastic. Yeah. Alan Ford, I, I'm, it may surprise you that given how much I've been banging on about application layer protocols for a while here, this one strikes me as being very MPTCP specific because it's all about shifting the options around, the MPTCP specific options. You haven't looked at how to use it for other options. And plus, what's more, that's out of scope. It's in scope as an MPTCP solution, and as you say, it matches the charter. So actually, I think it's quite a good match for this working group. So, uh, what I propose, what propose at this point is that you actually um, go and contact other working groups and maybe even present this in like area meetings and stuff and get some feedback about it, and then we can see if there's any other working group that thinks it's it's in their scope and should be done in their working group, and if not, we can do it here. And how many working group do you want us to look around <laughs> until we have a decision? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was concretely thinking about All probably um, T3 area and in area. Or actually, uh, uh, <laughs> think about it. Are there any... I don't mind just talking about this more, but are there any Tech, kind of technical questions yeah, about I think, what yeah. Liv is presented. So or technical issues are. In, I think we have I'd to separate into two parts. So, about that rather than so technical issues, and then in which working group this could fit, because that's yes. another issue. No, I was kind of, I was kind of waiting to see if there are more people coming to the and mic, they and they weren't. Right. So, but like we can also <laughs> talk. But I have a little bit of a technical technical question, which was related to um, um so. Um, you did say this can be used for other TCP options, and when I look at it, I think it would be super easy to use it for other TCP options. It would like be straight, right? Like there's actually no change yeah. required. So I think this is actually not MPTCP specific. It's TCP specific, yes. Yeah, but M MPTCP is an extension to TCP, so of course any solution that we do with MPTCP will work for regular TCP as well. So we are. Yeah, but I mean we also have a TCP maintenance working group. Of course, right? of course. But they never had this issue. So they have, they have produced window scale, they have produced timestamp, they have produced lots of draft and lots of solution. And they never had this issue because there was no use case with where, where you have two access networks and there is a strong benefit of having MPTCP on the part of the network. They haven't, they haven't seen that use case. So this use case comes from MPTCP and from the utilization of MPTCP. I think that you have an, uh, a proxy that implements a new option while like one of the endpoint doesn't implement the option is a very general use case for or kind of PCP extension. The benefit here is larger than for other options, yes, yeah. but it's they have this use case. Yeah, but they have, they don't have documents on explaining how to do this use case as far oh, as Because I know. nobody proposed it, so you might propose it there. Julius Krabacek, I would just want to add one element to the discussion. This is actually a quite manageable document. I've actually read it, all of it. And uh, uh, it's written with an eye to something that we sometimes neglect, that is implementability. 
Okay, there are a few things. So, for example, there is one thing, you cannot take a domain name, which makes it, and since you are doing strange things with TCP, you might want to implement it in a specific environment. So, the fact that there are no uh, domain names makes it much more implementable. And I cannot help but wonder whether if this document goes through a number of other working groups, it will still be a manageable and implementable protocol. I'm not sure, but the reason why there is no domain name in the in the connect message, in contrast with so with SOX, for example, is that we want to provide zero RTT. So we don't want to be in a situation where when the client sends a connect request to the converter, the converter has to do a DNS lookup before sending the seed. And that's a feature and not a bug. And the side effect is that it becomes doable in kernel space, which yes. is a welcome side effect. Yeah, yeah, that's a side effect. Vlad? Any more comments? Me. So as an AD, I think I would like to advise you to announce it on the TCP area and TCPM mailing list and get some feedback there. Okay, do you want us do you want us to try to present that this No, week? just put it on the mailing list you will get feedback. Okay. Just to add to Julius's comment, it it is nice and readable this draft. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, so thank you and congratulations to the people who wrote it. It's got nice protocol modeling and stuff, which is how people are advised to write this sort of document. So um it's you know it, don't, don't be if I, I'm basically, basically I'm trying to encourage everybody here to go away and read it. You will be able to get through it, I think, uh, and it would be great to have comments from people on. I was going to say on our mailing list, but on any mailing list you fancy. <laughs> but start on this one; that'd be great. I also just want to say, as an individual contributor, I like the proposal. Um, yeah, and th and thank you to the authors for for really really listening to the feedback that they've been on. Yeah, thank you to the contributors for really listening to the feedback that they've been on on the previous documents and discussion we had last time, and the follow on discussion to that because it's really come over that you've tried to react to that. Um, we've heard from at least one people who one person, which is Julius, who had some issues with with some of the previous. Um, approaches I and mean, we maybe it's worth trying specifically to get comments from some of the other people who had comments uh, to see if they can live with the approach that's proposed because uh, to ask your question about the um, that you want ad adoption I think well firstly we need to give people more of a chance to read it and get some comments on the main list supportive or with uh, suggestions um, you know and, and and secondly in in order to have the consensus it can be a working group item here or or somewhere else in another working group we've got to make sure that it's a solution that people can everyone can live with I mean that's kind of the definition isn't it so we've got to make sure that happens or that uh, people can come to the decision that that's um, you know not a, not a criteria any more any more comments we we'll probably um we'll probably on friday have a little bit of spare time uh looking at the agenda we've got an hour and we've probably not got an hour's worth of stuff so if people have the chance to read it before friday either this and the and the socks draft we probably can have a little uh you know 10 minutes or so slot where people can come up with the questions that they've thought of in the time of got during the busy week to um, to read the draft and think about it a bit more. Thank you very much. So next up is Vlad, I think. Do you want to use my laptop? Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Which one are you one of those? Uh, I don't think so. I thought I'd open more. Socks. It's it should be called socks. Is there socks on there? No, I thought I'd say mm. more. I haven't. So I am Vlad, and I'm going to talk about uh, SOX protocol version 6. Next slide, please. So SOX 5 is 20 years old, and it really needed a facelift. Uh, the main problem with it is that it makes liberal use of round trips. So we've got one round trip for, uh, uh, for negotiating the method of authentication, then another round trip, or maybe more, for authentication, and then uh, the, the client can finally request the establishment of a connection. Now, not, not only is it very chatty, but uh, in the meantime, there have been uh, uh, people have been developing zero RTT authentication methods. So, if the two entities had already communicated, they can authenticate in uh, just in only one message in in further connection attempts. So now we have this hot new use case where mobile users might want to use both the uh, cellular uh, interface and their Wi-Fi uh, to, uh, basically get, uh, to basically get more bandwidth. Now, and now the problem is that there's little to no uh, MPTCP usage on the server side, so we need a proxy for that. And the, since these mobile networks have high latency, we really have to trim down uh, on the RTT usage. So uh, next slide, please. So in SOX version six, we've done exactly that. So the client is very optimistic and it attempts to send as much information up front as possible without waiting for the authentication step to conclude if any authentication is required at all. Um, so it sends, so it advertises its supported authentication methods. It asks the, uh, the proxy to uh, establish a connection on its behalf and also supplies some application data if it has application data available. And it also specifies whether the proxy should use TFO or not. And it's, uh, finally, it's also extensible. So we've added TCP-like options in order to uh, do all kinds of cool stuff like maybe ask, maybe ask, the, ask the proxy to use a certain uh, MPTCP packet scheduler or whatnot. Uh, these still remain to be discussed and standardized. And uh, via these options that I've mentioned, uh, zero RTT authentication methods, uh, zero RTT authentication can be done via these uh, options. So next, next slide. So let's take a look at how SOX 6 looks when compared to SOX 5. So in SOX, uh, so in SOX 5, uh, you can see that the, cli uh, the client first advertises its authentication methods, and then the authentication proceeds, and then it sends a request gets a reply and then uh, then it can send data. So we've moved those uh, three bits, the, the blue bit, the green bit, and the red bit. We've moved them, uh, we've packaged them into one single message, which is the request, which the client sends at the very beginning of the connection. Then the server sends an authentication reply, which informs the client whether authentication has succeeded or whether further authentication is needed. Since this is the first connection, authenticate, further authentication may probably be needed. Uh, after, the, uh, after the authentication step has concluded, the proxy attempts to uh, create a connection to the server and then sends an operation reply to the client telling it whether it had succeeded or not. So next slide, please. Uh, in subsequent... Um, connection attempts, the client can uh, do zero RTT authentication, in which case the, uh, the server can attempt to initiate the connection as soon as it sees the request. So it sends an authentication reply and, and then an operation reply after the, the, um, uh, after the connection has been established. 
So next slide, please. So let's take a closer look at the request. So it's basically a mishmash of the uh, of the method advertisement message and the request, along with some data. So uh, please note that the client can include in, uh, in some initial data as part of the request, while still asking the the, uh, the proxy not to use TFO. Uh, the options are in TLB format, and they can include, uh, aside from authentication, zero RTT authentication data, they can include all kinds of other stuff that has yet to be standardized. So next slide, please. The authentication reply basically tells the client whether further authentication is needed or not. And also tells, it also tells, tells the client which, in, in case further authentication is needed, which method has to, uh, which method of authentication must proceed. In case authentication succeeded, it informs the client via which method the client got authenticated. So for example, if a client, uh, connects to the proxy via its home Wi-Fi, uh, the server probably expects some kind of authentication. But then if it connects to the proxy via its cellular network, the proxy knows that the client is one of its, uh, that the client is actually a paying customer and uh, tells the, the, basically tells the client, hey, no authenticate, uh, we authenticated you via the no authentication required method so that the client gets to learn that the, uh, that it shouldn't attempt to do any kind of authentication when using its cellular network. So next slide, please. Finally, um, as soon as the, the server, as soon as the proxy uh, receives, uh, so after the proxy attempts to connect, to connect to the remote server, it sends an operation reply, basically telling the client that it either had succeeded or if it hasn't succeeded, uh, it informs the client why it hasn't succeeded. So maybe the remote server has reset the connection or maybe, maybe the connection timed out or maybe the server is, uh, is unreachable or uh, any other or some other reason. Now, uh, there's one particular field of, one field of particular interest here. It's called the initial data offset. So uh, if you remember, if you, if you recall, uh, the, the request includes some initial data. Now, if, uh, if further authentication is required, the server has to buffer that initial data. This, this initial field, the initial data offset, basically gives the server a carte blanche as to how much of that initial data it buffers. So it can choose not to buffer any of the initial data uh, while waiting for the client to authenticate. Otherwise, it is largely useless. So next slide, please. So let's see how SOX v6 fares in action. In case we don't have TFO on any leg, uh, the, the client basically send, uh, initiates a three-way handshake. And uh, after one, uh, client to proxy RTT sends a request along with the initial data. Uh, the proxy also initiates a three-way handshake to the server and sends the data as soon as the, uh, as soon as uh, it receives the CNAC. In this case, it takes two end-to-end -end RTTs for a data response, same as with vanilla TCP. So there's no uh, overhead in terms of delay. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in case we have TFO on the proxy server leg, things get interesting. So the client gets to, uh, gets to send it. Uh, so the client sends a SYN that also contains the request and some data that the proxy can send, send to the server. Um, the proxy gets in, uh, starts initiating the connection to the server as soon as it re uh, receives this SYN from the client. Uh, and thus, and as such, we shave off one uh, uh, client to proxy RTT. In other words, if the proxy is on path, we actually have negative overhead. This is highly advantageous for mobile networks where um, we have high delay at, uh, at layer two. So next slide, please. And finally, if, uh, if we have TFO on all legs, the, the the SYN that contains the request basically gets translated into a SYN that contains the initial data and is headed for the server, and the server can reply uh, replies immediately, and we get a data response in one RTT. Same as with, when it, uh, with TFO without any 
uh, without any proxy in the middle. Next slide, please. So, can we use multiple proxies? Yes. So, um, uh, one solution would be to run socks over socks. So, the, basically, the client makes a request that contains another request in its initial data, and the initial data of the second request is the actual data that has to make it to the server. Um, this uh, socks can be stacked over socks multiple times, and no matter how many times we stack it, uh, the, the, the RTT uh, overhead is the same. So we get the data response in two RTTs uh, uh, if the, uh, there isn't any TFO available, or in one RTT with TFO on all paths, on all legs of the path, regardless of, of how many uh, servers we stack, or regardless of how many uh, times we stack socks over socks over socks. So no matter how many proxies we have on path, it, uh, we've got the same overhead. Alternatively, we could just configure the first proxy to go via the second proxy. The second proxy doesn't necessarily have to be a SOC 6 proxy. It, it, we, can, you, we can use any other proxy technology. So next slide, please. So we do have uh, an early prototype. So we have we have modified shadow socks in case some uh, some of you might be familiar with that proxy. It uses its own protocol. We've modified it so that it speaks SOX six, and we've also uh, created a mess a library that you can use to create SOX messages and write your own apps using that use SOX six. By the way, this is an early prototype, and there are some differences between uh, this and uh, this prototype and the draft. So, finally, I'd like to say some words about uh, about how this compares to uh, the other solutions. So, they are similar in, in that when you strip the initial exchange between the client and the proxy, you end up with the, the plain data stream. So, this, uh, however, we use an entirely <laughs> different starting point. So, this is a purely a layer five protocol. We do not use Synax to signal that the remote server has accepted the connection or not. We use, a, we actually use a, some, we use some TCP data for that. Uh, TFO or SYN data is not required, but it's, all, but it's required if you want to, uh, if you want uh, zero RTT overhead. But, uh, but if some middle box happens to strip TFO, then SOX still works. And finally, if a middle box doesn't kill TCP, it surely can't kill socks. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Comments, questions? So first, thank you. Uh, thank Julius you. Krabacek. Uh, first, thank you, because when in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were upgrading our client software to use SOX 5 instead of SOX 4A. We realized there was one thing that was shocking, was that upgrading to SOX 5 added one RTT to the unauthenticated case with no benefit whatsoever. Yes. So now, uh, now we've recovered this RTT. Well, so... <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> it took 20 years, but well. Um, the comment I wanted to make is that uh, this, I think it's important to stress how much Olivier's draft and your draft live in different spaces. And I think there is space for both. So this thing is something I would estimate that it would take 20 minutes to upgrade an existing SOX 5 proxy to use SOX 6 without authentication and without uh, zero RTT. The mm -hmm. simple thing would be very simple. I can imagine putting that in software that is not doing proxying just as a way of connecting to the software. I couldn't imagine using uh, Olivier's technology for doing the same. It also has the main name, so it fits the needs of SOX 5. So I think this has reason to exist even if Olivier's draft exists. The two are not at all mutually exclusive. And the other comment is Suppose that I'm writing a client for SOX 6. Hmm? Now, my client will probably want to speak SOX 5, want to speak SOX 6, and will want to speak to be able to speak to protocol converters. It doesn't care which it's speaking to. It just wants to establish, it wants the weaker guarantees 
that SOGS gives with respect to a, pro to a transport protocol converter. So it doesn't care which it speaks to. But the packet format between the protocol converter and the SOGS protocol are very different. So on the client side, I have to make two completely different implementations. Now, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I don't know if it's a good idea. Generalizing often yields completely unmanageable protocols. But I wonder whether it would be possible to consider having the same, uh, the same uh, packet format for both techniques and making it possible for a client, you know, to connect somewhere and discover whether it's speaking to a protocol converter or a SOC 6 proxy. Well, I mean, uh, well, uh, I don't well, need an answer well, now. Well, I'm just encouraging you to think about it. Well, uh, well, the, the thing is, it, yeah, it, it all has to do with uh, the message format. So, um, the very first byte of the data stream has to be four, five, or six in our case. So, uh, the VA solution should begin with a uh, seven or 107 or some other number other than that it's you know it's no i'm I'm thinking, sure I'm thinking of a single question. client that connects to a proxy mm -hmm. it doesn't oh, oh you mean in the server to client direction yeah sure yes. so it, it basically should go like this hi i'm a client i wish to speak socks version x and then the server says but i speak version y so my question so, would be rather, shouldn't SOX 6 support both protocols in a single unified protocol? I, well, yes. I mean, uh, if, the client, if a client uh, opens up a connection and says, I speak SOX 5, then the server should speak SOX 5. Great. So if, uh, if you could turn back to the slide, it has the request on it. Yes. So the first byte is actually the major version number, same as in SOX 4 and SOX 5. So, uh, so, uh, if, uh, so if a SOX 6 server gets a request that starts with a 5, just as in SOX 5, then it can start speaking SOX 5 to the client. Yes, that's clear. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Uh, I'm not sure how, how we can integrate that with Olivier's proposal. Uh, in the converter message, we start with a fixed header mm -hmm. that starts with a version number. And so if we say, for example, that version number below some value mm -hmm. are reserved for socks and higher value are reserved for converter, then yeah, I guess we just work. need to make sure that we don't use the value 0 to, to 4 that you use. But yeah. I don't remember whether it's in, in binary or it's an ASCII code or whatever, but we, that this is feasible. Yes, it's in binary format. And I have a light ed last editorial comment. Uh, the reason why you're allowed to truncate the data, the initial data, mm -hmm. was not clear to me um, uh, after reading the draft. It became clear after you gave your talk. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there is some discussion missing in the draft on this subject. Yes, I will amend the draft. Ben Schwartz. Um, OK, uh, a few points. I don't know if anybody in here was in, in Deprive this morning, but uh, the proposal in Deprive to uh, recognize the two protocols happened to be demuxable on the basis of the first few bytes was extremely controversial um, because it, uh, it, it tightly constrains future development of those protocols. Um, now, that once there's a, a use base that relies on them being demuxable, they can no longer evolve to modify those bytes independently. They have to be considered as a single protocol. So uh, that's, a, that's a point that, that sounds very scary to me. I wouldn't want to do that lightly. The, uh, the second thing I wanted to point out is that SOX5 is an incredibly widely deployed protocol um, in essentially every web browser in the world mm -hmm. and also quite a number of other places. Um, I think your your proposal is an improvement, and that's good. But it but agreeing on a new major version number of SOX seems uh, almost as big as agreeing on a new major version number of HTTP. 
and uh, again, is not to be not something that I, I think we should just uh, do within the MPTCP working group. No, I actually, I actually plan on work. Uh, I actually plan to work on this in the int area. Okay, but this is of interest to the MPTCP working group. Good. Uh, yeah, in, in a major version number for SOX, I can think of a lot of other things that I would like to improve about SOX. Um, so there are, so I hope that we don't just uh, just move ahead with, a, with an, an incremental change when there's a lot more things that we need, that, that need work. And uh, in particular, I want to point out that this, uh, this protocol's major improvement is a reduction in round trips. Yes. Um, that SOX, um, SOX proxies in general are used primarily in two cases. They're used on, uh, on localhost. Uh, yes, tour and stuff like that. Uh, to a very large extent, and to uh, also the, the remainder is largely on a LAN with uh, extremely low latencies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that latency savings is useful, but it's only really useful if the SOC server is at a large distance from you. And if the SOC server is at a large distance from you, then you do not have a trusted network anymore, which in my view means that encryption using TLS or, or an equivalent protocol should be mandatory. Well, uh, the use case that I mentioned on the very first slide was that uh, mobile mobile user, so mobile, uh, so 4G, 3G, and LTE have high delay. So if so, if you deploy a SAC server one hop away, you're still going to get a high RTT. Uh, in that case, you're you're over a wireless network with mysterious security properties. I would feel a lot more comfortable again if we specified end-to-end -end and uh, it, well, client to proxy encryption. I, I guess nothing nothing stops you from running SOC six over TLS. Uh, yes, I I agree that nothing appears to stop you, but I would point out that perhaps due to the lack of any recommendation in this uh, to, to actually do so, none of the SOX 5 clients today um, perform any kind of encryption between the client and the proxy. So for example, if your authentication data includes a username and password, those are sent in clear text between you and the proxy. So I, I really think that if you're building some, you appear to be building something that is useful over large networks, not inside private LANs. And whenever you're outside of a private LAN, uh, TLS should be, or equivalent, should be mandatory. I see. The other, uh, the, the final thing I want to point out is that uh, this use case is already served by proxies over HTTP, um, including uh, all, of the, all of the zero RTT functionality. So I think we should think very carefully about whether we want to duplicate the functionality of, of modern HTTP proxies, or whether we want to basically invest in improvements to those proxies. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mainly have two comments to, to Ben. So the first one is that uh, with MPTCP, there is already at least two deployments of using SOX, SOX <laughs> solutions to the bonding of any type of access networks together through a SOC server, and one of them is public, that's the over-the-box solution from OVH in France, and they use Shadow SOX uh, with a solution where there is encryption on the different links, so this addresses the, the comment from, from Ben, and this is a solution which is SOX V5 with, with, with Shadow SOX. It doesn't use TFO, but I guess if they could use your TFO code, they would be very happy to do that, so thanks for providing the code. And concerning the existence of HTTP proxies, uh, this is nice, we have lots of HTTP proxies, but we have to remember that there are other traffics than HTTP, so we live in a world where there are other applications than HTTP, so we cannot only rely on HTTP proxies. I, I definitely want to clarify that HTTP proxies include in the, entire, the entire TCP proxying functionality that we are talking about here uh, in the form of HTTP Connect. Julius Krobacek, I would also like to clarify that a normal human being cannot implement an HTTP proxy while obeying all the requirements of all the RFCs that, man uh, that are mandated by the RFCs. Uh, 
any more comments or anything? Anyone? Okay, so you're presenting this in Inter yes. later in the week? Mm -hmm. You haven't done so yet. Okay, great. All right. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you for bringing it to us. So that's great. We've reached the end of today's agenda. Uh, so Friday, when we're in a different room um, in the, I think it's called the afternoon session, uh, when Marcus will be talking about his robust session establishment proposal and Quentin talking about proposal for fast flow creation. Uh, and then there'll be some time if people have any more uh, reactions to the to particularly to the proxy work that we've heard about today and having had a think about it and read the drafts and stuff um so thank you very much to everybody for your contribution today thank you uh to dave and jing for doing the minutes that's been great um and see you all on friday Okay, 15 minutes, yeah. Just fine. I encourage a bunch of other properties.